Today we're going to be taking a look at the ROC5 Model B, a new SBC or single board computer from Radsir, which is based on the powerful ROC chip RK3588 SOC. The ROC5 B is available in three RAM configurations, 4 gigs, 8 gigs and 16 gigs. I've ordered the 8 gig to try out and I've also got their passive heatsink to cool it with. In terms of pricing, the 4 gig board is $129, the 8 gig $149 and the 16 gig $189. The RK3588 SoC has a 64-bit 8-core processor, which is made up of a quad-core A76 processor running at 2.4GHz and a quad-core A55 processor running at a lower 1.8GHz. The integrated Mali G610 MP4 GPU can do up to 8K at 60 frames per second. Taking a look around the board, we've got a 3.5mm audio jack, a single USB-C power input that also supports power delivery, although I'm not quite sure what the power delivery capabilities are, as the product page has 9 volts and 12 volts listed, while the wiki says 12, 15 and 20 volts. Next to that are two full-size HDMI ports, two USB 2.0 ports, two USB 3.0 ports, and then a 2.5 gig Ethernet port, which is really great to see on a SPC. They also mention that it has PoE support, what I presume this means is that they've brought out these pins which look to be in the same position relative to the GPIO pins as a Raspberry Pi. So you can probably use a PoE hat made for a Pi to power this. I don't have any spare PoE hats at the moment to try out. We've then got a fan connector at the top to power the fan that comes with the active heatsink. Next to that is a 40 pin GPIO header which follows the same general layout as a Raspberry Pi and is colour coded which makes it a bit easier to identify the power pins. Then there's a micro HDMI port, which is a unique inclusion but essentially should allow you to input an HDMI video signal up to 4K 60 frames per second to display or record. Next to that is a status LED and then two buttons, one for power and one for recovery. Along the last side we've got a real-time clock battery connector and an M.2 E key slot. This can obviously be used for a couple of add-ons but the most likely is going to be for a Wi-Fi module because the ROC 5B doesn't have any onboard Wi-Fi. I haven't gone with this optional add-on as I prefer to use a wired connection and the included 2.5 gig ethernet port is going to be faster and more reliable. Flipping the board over, we've got a prominent M.2 M key slot which supports a 2280 NVMe SSD. Along the edge are a CSR and DSR port for a camera or display and alongside those and next to the M.2 slot is a micro SD card slot. There's also a socket for an optional eMMC module if you'd prefer to use that to boot off instead of an SD card or an SSD. The board is designed in a Pico ITX form factor and is 100mm long and 72mm wide. Although this is technically a standard form factor, you'll have a hard time finding an enclosure for it outside of the ones offered by the manufacturer as it's just a very uncommon size. The passive heatsink is quite bulky, so I don't think we'll have any cooling issues even without the fan. They do have an active cooling option with a heatsink and a fan, which is a bit more compact, but then you'll obviously also have the fan noise. This just uses some snap-in pins to hold it in place over the CPU, and has thermal pads pre-installed. The RAM is split between these two chips alongside the CPU, and strangely the heatsink is offset from the center of the CPU, but it only covers one of them. I'm sure this won't cause any issues, it just seems a bit odd. So with the heatsink on the board, let's get the microSD card prepared and try boot it up. They provide images for Android, Debian and Ubuntu. I'm going to go with the Debian image for now and see how that runs. Flashing the microSD card is pretty simple. You just download the prepared operating system image from their page, then flash the microSD card using a utility like Etcher, then plug it into the board slot and it's ready to go. The default username and password are both rock, and we then arrive at the Debian desktop. If we open up HTOP, you can see we have 8 processor cores listed, which don't seem to be doing much at the moment, and then our 8 gigs of RAM, and we're not using any swap. Let's start out by trying to play back a YouTube video in the browser. I'll try this in both 1080p and then 4K. So let's first set the monitor to 1080p and open up YouTube. We can then set the video resolution to 1080p and then open up stats for nerds. Video playback in the window is really smooth, 
with a few drop frames here and there. We get similar results when we open it up to full screen. This is a really good quality stream which you wouldn't have any trouble watching. Now let's try to step it up to 4K. Opening the same video in 4K, we already start dropping some frames and playback is quite obviously stuttering. Opening it up to full screen is even worse, dropping a significant number of frames and stuttering to the point where playback is not really usable. Like with the Cardass Edge 2, this is most likely because the browser is using software decoding instead of hardware decoding. This essentially means that we're not using the GPU hardware for video playback but we're relying on the CPU to do the decoding through software, which is putting a lot of strain onto it. We can see if we open up HTOP while playing the video, we're basically maxing out our CPU continuously. Next I'm going to try running the Sysbench CPU benchmark, and I'll do this with HTOP running alongside it so that you can see the load on each CPU core. We'll give it 8 threads, one for each core, and then set the maximum prime number limit at 20,000. Running the test you'll see all 8 cores are maxed out. After 10 seconds the benchmark is complete and the cores all drop back down to idle. We managed to process a little over 5300 events per second, for a total of 53600 events for the test. Now these numbers don't really mean much on their own, so I ran the test on the Cardass Edge 2 and then on a Raspberry Pi 4 for comparison. The Edge 2 managed 5,150 events per second for a total of 51,500, which is about 4% slower than the ROC 5B in this benchmark. The Raspberry Pi only managed 195 events per second for a total of 1,950. This is obviously not a fair comparison, as the Pi only has 4 CPU cores running at a lower frequency, and it's also quite a bit cheaper than the ROC 5B. But the ROC 5B and Cardass boards are both over 25 times faster than the Pi in this benchmark. Next let's look at power consumption. I used a USB-C cable that supports power delivery. This shows that the ROC 5B is indeed running on power delivery, indicated by the PD at the top. I found that the ROC 5B runs at 2 watts when idle and 8 to 10 watts when the CPU is fully loaded. Lastly I wanted to try boot the ROC 5B from an NVMe drive. I prepared the NVMe drive in the same way I would do with a microSD card. I then tried following their guide to reflash the bootloader on the ROC 5B. You need to do this because the default bootloader doesn't support booting from an NVMe drive. They run you through a process using a utility called RK Dev Tool, which you'll need to load a configuration file, loader and SBR image into. You then need to get the ROC 5B into mask ROM mode and then reflash it. I was able to do all of these initial steps and the utility could see the board, but it crashed each time it completed the device test, which is when it would then start flashing the image. I tried this on two different computers and with a number of different cables and I always had the same result, so I wasn't able to get the board to boot from the NVMe drive in the end. When I boot the ROC 5B from the microSD card with an NVMe drive plugged in, we can see that the drive is being recognized, but it obviously won't boot from the drive without the bootloader being reflashed. It was a little disappointing that I wasn't able to get this to work, but hopefully I'll find a fix for this soon. Let me know what you think of the ROC 5B in the comment section below, and let me know if there's anything you'd like to see me try run on it. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more tech and electronics, projects, tutorials, and reviews.